Hi there. Uh, we're very excited to be here today talking about the new vision for decentralized finance uh, or DeFi. Uh, and we have a fantastic group of panelists today. Uh, I am always excited to uh, get to chat with uh, Aaron and Sam and Lewis. Uh, it's so great to meet you as well. And I think it's going to be a phenomenal conversation. Uh, I'm Marta Belcher. Uh, I am the chair of the Filecoin Foundation, and I am the general counsel of Protocol Labs, as well as special counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we have a phenomenal group of panelists here. Um, we have Aaron Lee, who's the founder of Modulo.so. Uh, we have Samuel Max, who's a general partner at Blockcelerate uh, VC. And we have Lewis Lee, who's the CEO of uh, Pacific founder ventures uh, uh, in China. So really excited to have you all and um, to have this conversation today about a topic that has been really top of mind, uh, I think, for the last year as, as it's been kind of uh, uh, blowing up in, in, in the positive way. Um, so uh, excited to <laughs> write exactly. More than you know. <laughs> yes, ex exactly, exactly. So I'm excited to uh, dive in here and uh, get to chat with all of you. Um, so I, I would love for when you guys do your first um, answer, your first question, if you can just give a little background about yourself as well, um, briefly. So I would love to start with uh, Sam. And Sam, I would love one of the topics in, in this world that has been really um, a big one over the last year um, has been DAOs. And so I would love if you could explain a little bit sort of what DAOs are and then talk about how you as an investor think about them um, in the context of value creation and value extraction um, compared to traditional companies. And also it would be terrific if you could tell us a little bit about what you are, um, you know, what you're doing as well in that context. So Sam Yilmaz, uh, hello everybody, uh, general partner at Voxler at VC, we are at Seattle-based uh, thesis-driven Web3 fund. Um, so how do I see DAOs? We recognize DAOs uh, and decentralized applications uh, as, we, as I have um, indicated in a paper I was a co-author in 2014 as an emerging wave of how we will coordinate labor, how we will organize resources and agree on and achieve consensus on workflows how we create value. So in a way, DAOs are the enterprise of the future where resources, uh, labor, voice, assets can be coordinated over the wire uh, powered by blockchain. And um, because of that perspective, what we do is investing in those decentralized applications and those DAOs that will look to uh, bring high value workflows on chain. And uh, we're also investing in service providers and infrastructure that enable those DAOs to succeed. And it so happens that those very service providers that help the DAOs uh, and DAPs build are also very helpful in helping um, for the old enterprises uh, of the Web2 era to transform themselves into uh, decentralized organizations or um, on-chaining their workflows. So that's about my perspective on DAOs and how that leads to uh, what we do. Thank you, Sam. Um, that's that's terrific. And I think a really interesting perspective to hear. Um, Aaron, I wanted to turn to you to give us sort of uh, a big picture on what you do and also a big picture on, you know, how you think about DeFi, how you're thinking about um, this space and and sort of a short explainer really on um, those tools. Yeah, gladly. Uh, thank you, Marta. And uh, my name is Aaron Lee. Uh, like Marta said, I'm uh, the founder of a new project called Modulo.so. Uh, this is a advanced infrastructure for uh, crypto wallets and that's frictionless, that's more secure and has a much stronger uh, asset recoverability. Um, it's more programmable. And the reason that uh, I'm doing all this is, uh, as many people know, crypto is really prone to hacks 
lots of people just lose their money every day. Um, on the side, I help tracking uh, theft incidents and uh, major hacks, and I see just regular people losing millions of dollars, like some 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 of them tens of thousands of dollars uh, at a time. And they say, "This is our entire side life saving. Please help me." And sometimes when when this happens, I, I hope that I can do more, and I, I just have more time. Uh, Figuring out a solution for everybody, but uh, 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 in majority of the cases, because of the, the poor infrastructure and how crypto is handled uh, today, uh, it's just not possible, and they just have to buy the loss and move on. Um, but they, they, they could all change um, as we build better infrastructure. Um, the we. With respect to DeFi, and I, I know DeFi is one of the major uh, use cases, so to say, for crypto. And one of the many reasons that people <clears throat> go to crypto and try to uh, engage with these uh, new ways of managing their asset. Uh, and so in, in some of the platforms, they have control over their own asset, in, in, but in others, like when they use centralized exchange, uh, or use crypto.com, Binance, Coinbase, uh, they don't. And and when those um, central actors get hacked, uh, or when, like a couple of days ago, uh, when the stock market went sideways and uh, Coinbase announced, okay, in case of bankruptcy, we may have to seize your asset. Uh, not that's something that we prefer to do, but this is just how things work. <laughs> But that raises an alarm, and I think this is uh, the hacks, security, and uh, the how how we can use technology to to improve the uh, situation uh, around uh, custodial asset uh, and making it non custodial. That's something that uh, I like to talk about. <laughs> Got it. That's super helpful. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Lewis, turning to you, um, would would love to hear from you um, how you're thinking about this space, um, and especially as an investor, um, you know, from your perspective, what you're looking at when you're looking at this technology. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, this is not the first time I I, I, I joined Horus. I think that this topic is quite broad. Uh, particularly um, the the topic we talk about, I think uh, investors for investor, I think uh, the most important thing is about uh, getting the arena to understand that is uh, um, a new technology that will be uh, generalizing in the futures. So uh, now let me give you some introduction of myself. I'm a, a, a mobile internet generation, so I get my fortune by uh, multiple unicorns. So by how I run my company and also the group, I, I would not say mine, but our investment portfolio before the COVID, we are already decentralized. Let's say we don't have office, okay? Believe it or not, before the COVID, we canceled the office already. So, and the portfolio that we invested, we don't, well, are particularly not having any control uh, power. So basically, my comp our company that we invested, we are really delighted to merge with other company that who are actually doing much better, and or we don't even uh, I would say we don't have prefer one particular leader to run uh, the different industry. So the 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 matrix of the company we invested or we enable. Uh, have slightly already get the concept about decentralization. So we generally understand it before it getting a hot topic. And I think right now uh, it's still an explorational period. So uh, I think that uh, I will uh, only care about the, lead, the leader, the founders, uh, the group of people who started it, whether they have an ecosystem mindset or not. So. Let's say uh, I grew up because I, I was very active in Boy Scout. Okay, so 
not not related to my i mean legal make legal legal majors uh auditing financial background i think boy scout is a very um hierarchic okay uh system all right so for the second point i want to mention about from investor perspective um how to distribute or uh, how to segmentate the the hierarchy okay it is quite important about different members okay so let's say the eastern uh, orient, oriental and the western part the cultural uh, uh the cultural difference is quite a lot so i i'm still very surprised that uh people consider a, a single system or single software or single new entrepreneurial startup we we run the world okay this not not for the logo like run the world system but i still don't see like microsoft we have a kingsoft in china and we have wechat and facebook and instagram so yeah for that part i can see uh, i'm still quite excited to 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 know more about it but uh for investing the the number three rules is uh as long as they are they have growth okay and also something between 35 years old to 55 okay generally we can't fight uh, our biological clock right so people uh who are in between this age they're more experienced they still uh being done uh, energetic to to make some differences okay so one um decentralized already investing second is uh we want to understand the ecosystem mindset of the founding team or the core team and also the 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 age okay the different stage of the people's life so 35 to 45 years old i would say yeah got it um yeah. and uh going over to you sam um i want to talk i guess a little more broadly about these technologies and um really the sort of how they fit into the entire economy. So like, let's start by talking about stable coins. Um, obviously this has been a pretty big topic this week um, with everything going on with, with um, US Terra and um, would love to hear how you're thinking about things like stable coins in the broader economy. Yeah, so uh, stable coins is one subcategory of a programmable value exchange. And so I take the position that, yes, it's um, closer in utilization to dollars in your bank account because they're supposed to be pegged to a fiat currency. Um, but really the value comes from the fact that they speak the language of smart contracts and these uh, stable coins and uh, can be uh, commanded and wielded by uh, pre-made agreements that smart contracts carry with their if this then that statements as to how future transactions will happen. And in the larger uh, economy, um, when we consider all value is socially declared, there's nothing that you could pick up and say this has value because um, I say so. <laughs> um, there needs to be a consensus that it is of value and other people have to agree to it. And the way to uphold value relies on our ability to demonstrate that people previously have agreed to the rules of a given asset. So programmability of these assets, including stable coins, is um, how we can agree on uh, future transactions, how we can agree on assets, and how we can agree on the rules of the transactions and assets that give them their values. So in general, um, we are expecting that uh, most of the enterprises of today, most of the institutions of today, uh, will transmigrate their workflows on chain and stable coins uh, will be uh, an important part of that. Uh, and then there are ultimately many kinds of stable coins. We take the position that even algorithmic stable coins, which is a subcategory of ISAM, is always still a matter of collateralized stable coin. 
which is by other people's standards supposed to be a different classification. So we tend to differ. Um, and ultimately, you the best stable coins are those that have good collateral of diverse nature that uh, are themselves um, liquid. And in the event of a need for those collateral to be liquidated, there's a marketplace with a demand to soak that up. In the case of UST, what happened was we were uh, trying to back a stable coin that's supposed to be pegged to a dollar with a volatile asset with limited liquidity uh, whose supply is unlimited. It was designed to have a virtuous cycle, but it turned into a, a vicious cycle where the success of Luna, which is the underlying collateral that, would supposed, that was supposed to back UST, um, uh, d- depended on the success of UST. So when trust wavered for a moment in UST and people were looking to get out, that created um, a sell pressure on Luna. And Luna's mechanic is that new Luna is printed when there is a need to liquidate UST. So that effectively accelerated the run of the bank. It was the only modulator of how much Luna one could print. Um, And uh, effectively, it was a race to the bottom. Uh, What's interesting, though, is still some very sophisticated investors in the weekend before this event happened were still backing UST and Luna. So I think that's um, a case in point as to how, you know, uh, investors and entrepreneurs in the space need to be very cognizant about uh, tracking activity on chain and seeing metrics like, hey, most of Ethereum is bombarded with UST transactions on Ethereum. Why is that happening? Um, And be aware of what's happening and have that contextual um, overview of, of their activities and portfolio. So, um, and that's the beauty. We make things programmable. We make things transparent. We make them auditable. And uh, we recognize that we are stakeholders in much larger systems um, than we were previously able to recognize. So let's leverage that by um, seeing the on-chain metrics we can inspect. Thanks, Sam. And that really, I think, leads into this topic that Aaron was covering on before, which is, you know, sort of the, the, um, and I think this is not uh, unique to the crypto space, but uh, certainly leads to a lot of publicity in the crypto space is the security breaches, the hacks, the, um, in some cases, things that are, uh, you know, exploiting uh, issues on the back end, but sometimes things that are in plain view. Um, and, and so Aaron, I know that you're really involved in a uh, new wallet infrastructure project and you're, what you're working on is really designed to mitigate some of these security issues. So could you tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, you've already touched on this, but a little more about how you think about um, security in this space and also um, about, uh, you know, your project and how you're mitigating these concerns. Yeah, sure. We'll be happy to. Uh, you know, one unique uh, thing about crypto and DeFi is decentralized. And decentralized means uh, things are supposed to be uh, handed out to the users or at least multiple actors in the space. Uh, that includes a key to the to the assets. And traditionally, and in so far for the last couple of years, the uh, what when people use wallets like MetaMask. Uh, or or some other wallets, uh, they store the key uh, in a place, say in a computer somewhere in the file system, and when that key is compromised, uh, say a hacker gets it, and you so you get control over your entire asset, whatever DeFi application you use, uh, say you store hundred thousand uh, dollars to to generate twenty percent yield in somewhere. <laughs> uh, they so, so get a hold of all that and they can transfer it to their account or they can just uh, play dumb and wait until you get a million dollars, then take the action. And I see a lot of that. Some hacks, uh, hackers just wait for you, a small fish to become a big fish or when the market is good. <laughs> and especially recently, they devised all kinds of way to um, 
to to make uh, the follow up transactions untraceable, like through tra traded cash and use some zero knowledge proof based uh, mixers to uh, hide their track. And and that just makes uh, even the best uh, people uh, unable to act, uh, like including the FBI. Um, so um, given all this. Um, there, there are two approaches to solve this problem, and I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, uh, one, one is the centralized actors like uh, Binance, like Coinbase, and uh, uh, some wealth management platform like what people already use, uh, uh, like us from something like that. If they ever offer crypto, I haven't tracked, <laughs> but just to give an example, so they can. Say okay, we, we're gonna uh, just give you money to us. We'll we'll secure it. <laughs> but when the money gets to a certain amount, you 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 you, you still worry about okay, well, what if they mess up? What if uh, they just seize my asset? There are all kinds of problems with that, and that's sort of uh, in contravention with the uh, original intent, which is like we we are doing DeFi by we are going back to a centralized approach again. And another is uh, to improve the security of your wallets. And maybe the step one is to control the damage. Like, but why, when a hacker gets a hold of your key, you uh, you lose you lose all your asset? How about if I if I mess up, I mess up small time instead of a million dollars, <laughs> everything that I have. And uh, and that's part of what we do. Right? We make uh, this thing programmable. We we uh, we uh, uh, enable. We we use smart contracts for all of this. Uh, so you can set up a spending limit. You can set up all kinds of rules and alerts. So you are always in, informed and you can control the damage. And another thing is when you lose your asset, you uh, you need a way to recover. Like a lot of people just forget about the key. And the reason they, they, they forget about their keys, uh, when they create the wallet, they are told, okay, so don't, don't back it up anywhere. Just write it on a piece of paper. And guess what? The paper just uh, maybe went into the rubbish bin <laughs> sometime later. Uh, or some people just get lazy and back it up to iCloud. And uh, and, and it, you, you know how easy it is to leak iCloud photos. Maybe you know, you know just your, your friends uh, saw you have a interesting photo <laughs> while you are in the restroom. <laughs> uh, things like that happens and people just lose, uh, people just have all kinds of ways of losing their money. And um, what we do is we uh, uh, we we eliminate we eliminate the the these seed phrases and the private keys this concept altogether. We use uh, something a lot more secure uh, called a one-time password, and, and I'm sure a lot of people already use it uh, in their daily life. Like when they log into Coinbase, they're asked to go to Google Authenticator or some 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 kind of a SMS based code, and they're given a six digit, and that six digits they are different every time. So by moving access uh, to something like that, we um, we uh, eliminated the the risk of hacking and and made it a lot easier for people to manage and control their their assets. Um, so uh, obviously there are other approaches uh, in the space. Like some people are pushing uh, for uh, multi-party signature. Or, or special uh, wallets, uh, and that uh, in, in plain language that means uh, you hold part of the key, uh, some trusted centralized party hold another part of the key, or maybe there are multiple of them. And when you guys come together, uh, you can move your asset. Like for example, Coinbase hold half half of your key, you hold the other half. So Coinbase couldn't seize your asset, and uh, when you use uh, a certain app. Uh, you, you authorize the app to retrieve both the key uh, from from your storage and from Coinbase, so um, you you can move your asset. But the risk is still there. Like you you uh, as, as soon as you aggregate the keys, <laughs> uh, there's a risk of uh, that key being intercepted and you get hacked. Uh, Got and, it. And, yeah. Got it. Uh, Anything else you want to add there, or? Uh, yeah, may maybe I should give the mic to other people. <laughs> okay, well, we'll come back to this topic because I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot to say here. Um, 
And I, I do want to paint a slightly sunnier picture uh, of, of this space. You know, I know when you're talking about the downsides and the risks, um, it, you know, it definitely, it, it definitely, I think, uh, it can sometimes drown out the uh, optimism in the space. Um, but Lewis, I would love for you to talk about some of the use cases that you're seeing here that are, you know, on the sunnier side, things that are, are really interesting and potentially could move technology forward. Okay, hi. Um, so as I said, Web 3.0 or the DeFi or decentralization uh, technique uh, is a way of communicating or is the way how to build ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Particularly interesting in four fold, like full of people, talent, full of money, uh, full of cargo and full of uh, 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 like, like, okay, I was saying my money is uh, uh, information as well. So basically, I have a very interesting, uh, or I'm very interested in one particular uh, 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 setting called AVA, A A V E, that is from Northern Europe, who do define about uh, financing and money lending. So I think they're doing well from 2017. Um, and they change a little, uh, a few times. They do ICO, and then they do a uh, point to point, like P two P, a peer to peer financing. I think the way that I, I can't, uh, I think uh, it's not too. Uh, we have in don't have uh, enough time that we can elaborate a lot. But I think uh, I'm particularly interesting in this uh, divide. Okay, if you want to take a look, I can send you a, a report about this particular. Uh, uh, system uh, that uh, ecosystem they are, they are, they are funding. I think as well they they have a very deep understanding how to tackle the problem about the trust issues, and you know, about uh, the the transaction cost. So that um, by using that uh, Ava, I think it will solve a lot of problem about uh, the credit and also the trust as well. So I think the industry is heading towards. Uh, closer to zero transaction costs. So people don't need to spend too much time to communicate it, uh, something they rely on. So a credit, okay, uh, transparency and credit uh, trustworthiness is the, the trend that I can see. Um, my prediction is within five to 10 years, I think all those middlemen and also the platform that we're using, so called we can like, a monopoly uh, platform. They will mm, try to bit the the function of them will begin uh, demised. So I think um, yeah, first that you can take a look for the Ava, and I think that um, my expectation for the industry twine will be uh, five to ten years. The the change will be very dramatic, and also very uh, constructive. Awesome. And do others want to dive in here on other kind of use cases, especially yeah. especially you, Sam? I would love yeah. to hear more on your thoughts there. Uh, for sure. Yes, Aave, Compound, um, Maker, Innovative um, Initiatives of the past iteration of you know, DeFi building blocks. And now we're seeing uh, the newer uh, players in town that are adding or extending Aave and Compound type of and maker uh, Cassidy's uh, centrifuge maple and enabling them, enabling real world assets to be on chain and then further uh, innovation in um, locking assets into liquidity pools, taking your representative tokens of those liquidity pools, borrowing against them, leveraging and so on. So. Yes, DeFi has uh, for crypto native assets and other other ledger assets have has a bright future. But what I'm very uh, interested to further look at uh, and invest in is going beyond finance. The reason why I think we've seen uh, DeFi take hold and grow a, a whole lot is not because the world needed decentralized finance the most or there's greatest value to be had in, in financial use cases. It's just that the assets themselves and the rules around the assets 
um, were easily transcribed, translated into uh, an on-chain um, workflow in that if an asset is crypto native to begin with, like Ethereum and in Bitcoin, and you could say, here's a smart contract, you lock it in, 150% collateral, you borrow this token, call it DAI. That's fairly easy and standardizable. Um, what I envision will happen is we'll take those workflows and uh, building blocks and take them to uh, non-financial use cases and take them to decentralized computation further decentralized access to bandwidth um decentralized um did i say storage <laughs> <laughs> thank you i appreciate that <laughs> very much yeah uh and and then even further why not a decentralized transportation why not a decentralized um telecom and uh, construction and what have you, and uh, or even tooling for governments that uh, can leverage decentralized governance tools uh, to allow for greater participation and visibility and downstream auditability to how those votes are then implemented. Um, so there will be other decentralized applications going beyond the financial use case. This was step one because of the assets and rules being easily translated uh, to on-chain. And then there's many more that we'll see. And we're beginning to see that with real-world assets coming on-chain within DeFi. Yeah. And Aaron, you know, I would love to hear from you as well. You know, what, what are the use cases in general that you see that are going to be um, potentially transformative here? Um. One one trend I, I'm I started noticing is uh, uh, microtransactions and in-game uh, activities. Like people have realized, uh, while the DeFi application doesn't have to be boring, it can be fun. And while you are playing game, you actually get rich, and uh, not in a, a in a traditional gaming way. Like you spend all your day getting some equipment and getting some virtual asset, but uh, this time. Uh, you are actually moving a lot of money in the game, and that has real world uh, consequences. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, that's just a start, and there are um, other uh, ways that this can manifest. Not just games; like not not everyone play games, of course. <laughs> but uh, uh, what if we take the DeFi concept uh, and and the blockchain technology to some other applications like legal? Uh, uh, w w what if we can have uh, those people who, who need legal help to uh, be able to, uh, to to state their problem on some platform and we uh, we have all kinds of uh, interested party to sponsor uh, their problem and have uh, lawyers to be more comfortable taking cases when given this uh, open openness and transparency uh, as I see blockchain and DeFi uh, technologies enabled. <laughs> so I think there is a whole world to explore here. <laughs> awesome. And I, you mentioned legal, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think, you know, I think that the legal regimes that these, um, that companies are sitting in um, have a pretty large effect on the, whether the technology is going to be successful um, Sam, how do you think about that? How do you think about the jurisdictions, the ju jurisdictional issues, the legal issues as an investor? There's my mute button. Um, how do I think about it? Well, I would love to hear more from you, Martha, since you're taking more of the, you know, legal side of the house. Um, but I do have some favorite jurisdictions. Uh, because of the clarity they offer early on, whether it's for financing and offering of securities or for a clarification on um, taxation on founder earnings, taxation on uh, protocol earnings, taxation on you know, the revenues collected into a treasury, uh, or even structures that certain states allow and recognize as legal persons like DAO LLCs, 
and so on. So in the U.S., Wyoming has been, and Colorado has been uh, innovative, but uh, internationally, the uh, L countries, the Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Lithuania, have been <laughs> the Switzerland. And uh, yeah, happy to hear more from you on the, the alphabet soup of regulators in the U.S. and, uh, you know, how you think the ecosystem needs further clarification and who could move the needle there. Yeah, you know, I do think um, one of the things I say uh, a lot that I think is, I think it's a myth that the space is unregulated, um, very much a myth. Um, really, the uh, the on-ramps and off-ramps, and at least in the United States, where crypto is uh, bought and sold and held are heavily regulated entities. Um, these are, you know, um, chartered banks or trust companies. These are these are companies that have minimum capital requirements and have to register with FinCEN and report suspicious transactions and do KYC. So there's already a ton of regulation in this space. The other thing I would say is I think it's really important to be technology neutral. So I think that one of the things in this space um, is this idea that we need to regulate the technology. But, you know, I think laws and regulations should be about activities, not about technologies. So just as like an example, if you're committing fraud, it doesn't matter whether you're committing fraud using cryptocurrency or cash or pen and paper or the telephone, right? The technology you use doesn't matter. What matters is that you're committing fraud. Um, and there's a variety of actions that can be taken by, a, a, as you said, an alphabet soup, uh, the SEC, the CFTC, the CFPB, all of these um, you know, potential actions that can be taken to address this using laws that already exist. So in my view, for the most part, we don't need cryptocurrency specific laws and regulations. I think laws that already exist already sensibly can be and already are being applied to cryptocurrency. Um, so that's sort of big picture how I think about it. So as we're going into the last five minutes, um, I just want to do a very like high level, big picture from each of you, um, very short, um, in you know a few words or sentences. Um, where do you think we are in DeFi in five years, ten years? Uh, what does the future look like in this space? So let me start with you, Lewis, and then I'll go to Aaron, and then we'll end with Sam. Uh, I think <clears throat> the next five year is basically. Um... Uh, broadcasting and education uh, exaggeration. So I don't think that f within five years still going to the peak, like what happened right now for all those mobile internet or even the, the, the innovation that we have. So next five year will be a education and also broadcasting period. Okay, so that, that's my like, simple uh, way of like, seeing it, like, education and broadcasting, promoting. Awesome, thanks Louis. Uh, over to Aaron. So I think the next five years, we'll see a lot more infra infrastructure and uh, at, at a real world scale. Uh, right now, it's more like uh, the, the pre-internet stage, if I can use this analogy. <laughs> and when that exposed to internet stage, like uh, in the late 90s, that, uh, that, that changed the entire perspective and all the stuff we discuss, uh, the tools and the platform we use today, uh, most of them only exist and we'll get a whole bunch of new names. <laughs> uh, and what about you, Sam? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I remember you asked this question in a prior panel a while back. Uh, so we would have to look back and check for a cross consistency. <laughs> But um, so five years versus 10 years, I guess it's a little different. But uh, if we were to say 10 years more confidently, uh, we could say, one, there'll be more trillion dollar DAOs and DAPs than trillion dollar companies. Uh, more than half the world's remittance and value exchanged, not just currency remittance exchange will be on chain. And this will include um, voice that has associated dollar value and uh, contracts of future value, enterprises, government, institutions, individuals, bilateral, multilateral agreements of all kinds. 
Uh, so two points right there for you. Well, I think that's bold. I like that prediction. Glad this is being recorded because I think that uh, that one may end up turning out to be true. Um, you all, this has been fantastic. It's always a phenomenal uh, oppor- It's always phenomenal to get to chat with you, and it's been um, a wonderful conversation. Um, so very, very much appreciate getting to chat, and uh, look forward to another Horaces panel in the future. Uh, so talk to you soon. Bye, Bye all. Take care.